Hello, welcome to the Friday, February 14th, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storms and its Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. And when it comes to network traffic these days, most of it, of course, is encrypted. And the big leader here tends to be HTTP. Harder to actually find a website these days that does not support HTTPS. But aside from HTTP, there are a number of other protocols that could benefit from TLS. And one of these protocols is LDAP. So mid last year, Microsoft did publish some guidance where they recommended that you should use LDAP as essentially LDAP over TLS or LDAP signing and another LDAP feature referred to as channel binding. And of course, given that Microsoft and Active Directory does rely on LDAP, uh, this is a substantial improvement in security and thus prevent a number of real attacks. So Microsoft was going to go ahead and make LDAP as the default behavior starting in March with the March patch Tuesday update. But well, uh, deploying TLS and deploying it correctly isn't all that straightforward. You first need certificates and all of that good stuff. So a number of Microsoft customers complained about this deadline and Microsoft earlier in February moved away from the March deadline and now states that they will introduce this new default behavior sometime second half of the year. Of course, the problem with any deadline that's a few months out is, well, it sounds far enough that you're probably going to get surprised again. And if sometime in September or October, this new default behavior will be released by Microsoft. Well, to get you ready for it, we do have two diaries today by Rob about how to check which systems in a network do use LDAP versus LDAP S and how to script some of the content configuration options. So he made public a number of pretty neat PowerShell scripts that should you help tackle this problem. Now, there's one thing that Microsoft will release in March, and that's additional logging around LDAP S and LDAP. So that'll also give you more insight in what's currently happening on your network with LDAP. So definitely take a look at these new events that you have available here. And if for whatever reason you don't want to use LDAP S, there is also some specific guidance available how to prevent the new default behavior from kicking in once it's being released. And researchers at the Singapore University of the Technology and Design took a look at a number of different Bluetooth chipsets and identified 12 different vulnerabilities, at least 12 they released now, and they say they have more vulnerabilities that they are not free to disclose yet. Now, overall, I don't really rate these vulnerabilities that terribly serious. Uh, 12 vulnerabilities in total, 11 of them essentially are denial of service vulnerabilities that either crash or deadlock the device. There is one security bypass vulnerability. That's probably the more secure one here. It only affects one particular uh, vendor. TE-Link Semiconductor is the chipset that's affected by this vulnerability. And the security bypass vulnerability would allow an attacker to pair with the device and then essentially send arbitrary commands to the device. Now they looked at about half a dozen different Bluetooth chipsets. Of course, the number of affected devices is much larger because these chipsets go into all kinds of uh, different systems. Now they listed sort of a couple samples here. For example, the Fitbit Inspire is sort of one uh, device that I've seen quite a bit. Also, the August Smart Lock is one of the devices they have. They also have another, like one of those TSA compliant uh, luggage locks. Well, I don't think really for a device like this, uh, Bluetooth low energy vulnerabilities are necessarily the biggest threat if you can open it with a TSA compliant key. And vendors have released patches for these vulnerabilities, but of course it may be tricky in some cases to first of all identify that your device is using a vulnerable chipsets and then to apply the actual firmware update. 
But well, uh, since you're probably all done patching now from Microsoft's Patch Tuesday and have nothing else to do on Friday, you probably want to take a look at your security software, in particular, Symantec's Endpoint Protection. It fixed a number of vulnerabilities earlier this week, so something you probably do want to t pay attention to. And I haven't really seen much mention of these vulnerabilities. Now, they can be used for elevation of privilege. Uh, they also can be used to execute arbitrary code via a DLL injection attack. And finally, a couple of denial of service vulnerabilities. And then it's interesting sometimes sort of these quiet things that happen on the internet sort of to keep things working. For example, for DNSSEC, every six months, there is something called a root key signing key ceremony. And well, the 40th of these ceremonies was supposed to happen on February 12th, but had to be delayed because apparently due to a mechanical issue, the safe that contained the key material could not be opened. So real interesting availability over confidentiality and integrity issue here, but uh, not all is lost. It turns out that there is a second facility that has copies of the key material and hopefully that safe is still working. In the meantime, there is no disruption in DNSSEC expected. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.